So we're going to turn now to the beginning of John's Gospel and think a little bit about the ministry of John the Baptist. I find John the Baptist very challenging because he was relentless in his desire to point to Jesus. And even when he was confronted by a hostile opposition, he stayed faithful. It may well be that our, in our own day and age, we could be hauled before the authorities and asked to give a reason or an account for why we talk about Jesus and organize our churches in the way we do. My hope would be that if, if I do ever find myself in that scenario, that I'd be faithful as John was faithful. Now, of course, John the Baptist was making quite a splash, we might say, in his early ministry. Uh, great crowds were coming to follow him, and uh, he was causing quite a stir amongst the religious authorities. As we pick up the story in John 1, 19 and onwards, we find that, that first of all, there are a group of priests and Levites who ask the question, who do you think you are? The priests and Levites um, were very concerned about religious ritual, particularly the forms and regulations for temple worship. It was their role to ensure that worship happened by the book. The Levites were the temple bouncers. And if there was any contravention of the law, these were the men who were sent to arrest and charge. Who are you, John, they ask. Well, his answers are interesting, aren't they? He doesn't give much away. I am not the Christ, he says. I am not Elijah. Well, yes, he was creating quite a stir, and many people were saying, is this the long-awaited Messiah? No, he says, I am not. We have much to learn, actually, from his testimony. His words pointing away from himself, his tone was self-deprecating, his speech was monosyllabic, not because he had nothing to say, but because he wanted the focus not to be on himself. And it's with a degree of exasperation that they finally say in verse 22, well, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? His answer is interesting. He says, I'm a voice. By contrast, of course, John has described Jesus as the word. He says, I'm a witness, pointing to another. I'm the messenger, Isaiah prophesied. But actually he, Jesus, is the message. I prepare the way. He is the way. He is a voice crying in the wilderness, make straight the path for the Lord. They need a new highway, a new route to get to God. He's building a good straight road so the royal motorcade can travel down it. Who is this John? He builds bridges so people can get to Jesus. He knows that he's not the Christ. He has an important role to play. Indeed, others thought very highly of him but he wants to point to the one who is full of grace and truth. And I hope that if ever I am hauled before the authorities and they say, who do you think you are? That I too will say I'm just a voice, a messenger, someone who wishes to tell people about Jesus Christ. Well, the focus of attention in John then moves on to another group of religious leaders in verse 24. The Pharisees ascend, and they ask, why do you baptize if you're not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Okay, we've understood that you don't have a high view of your own office, but by what authority do you act? And perhaps more particularly, why are you baptizing Jews? For sure, they would have known a kind of baptism, a proselyte baptism for those who were non-Jews converting to Judaism but somewhat arrogant in John's case, surely, to ask Jewish people for water baptism. Well, at one level, John says, well, actually, all I can do is make people wet. Um, I'm calling people to repent. And baptism is, is an outward sign of an inward reality, as we sometimes put it. 
But more importantly, there is one who follows on after me, who will baptize not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. So by what authority, John, do you act? Well, his authority, he says, is that of a servant, one who is not worthy to wash or to untie the sandals of the master. John spends all of his time pointing away from himself and pointing towards Jesus. And within John's response, we have a very clear understanding of what it is that Jesus came to do. There are two tasks that John believes the Messiah would perform. The first is that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He repeats that in verse 29 and in verse 37. And actually, it's a staggering claim to be made about the Messiah. Perhaps he had in mind Isaiah 53, a lamb that was led to the slaughter, one who would have the iniquity of us all laid upon him. Perhaps more likely, he might have been thinking of the Passover lamb, a yearly memorial each Jewish household had to recollect God's rescue from Egypt. <clears throat> and they did this by selecting and killing a lamb and then splattering the blood of the lamb on the lintel and the doorpost of their homes. And when God poured out his wrath on the people, he would see the blood that had been put on every Jewish household and he would pass over, sparing them the weight of his judgment. In that way, sin was atoned for. And perhaps John is particularly thinking about the fact that Jesus will come before Pilate, uh, the end just before his death, and here, just as the temple priests are examining the Passover the lamb, the de declaration that this lamb is faultless, this lamb is worthy, actually, to be sacrificed in this way. Now, whichever of those pictures John dominantly has in mind, the conclusion is obvious, that Jesus will do what neither John nor any other religious ceremony can do, he will take away the sins of the world through his sin-bearing death. That's fantastic news for John and for his followers. The second thing that John says about Jesus's role is that he will baptize with the Holy Spirit there in verse 33. This is the internal work of washing sin away, the new birth that will make us Children of God that John has already spoken of in the first half of chapter one, born of the Spirit of God. The Christian life begins with baptism, not baptism by water, which is um, symbolic or, or a sacrament, a sign of something that's actually gone on internally. It's the baptism of the Spirit that changes a person's life. And whilst we constantly need to be filled and refilled with the Holy Spirit, Baptism is something that happens at the beginning. It's that first moment of being brought in to God's family. And actually, isn't that fantastic news? Right at the beginning part of John's Gospel, we hear John the Baptist preparing the way for the Messiah by saying that he is the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world, and he is the one who baptises in the Holy Spirit. He will make lasting change in a person's life by dealing with their sin and washing them clean. It's been quite trendy for a while for, um, for teenagers and some adults to wear those, those badges with the letters WWJD. And of course, WWJD stands for What Would Jesus Do? And that's actually a good reminder, isn't it, to us to look down at our wrist and to remember in any and every circumstances what would Jesus do? How would Jesus behave in this situation or in this circumstance? But actually, as I reread John chapter 1, I re remind myself that actually there are things that Jesus did that only he could do that I could never do for anybody else, let alone for myself. Only he is the true sacrifice for sin. Only he can wash away our uncleanness. 
And I wonder whether the next time you see WWJD, it might be helpful to remember, what would John do? Because he's a great model, actually, of a faithful witness here. Somebody whose testimony consistently points to Jesus. John's witness to Jesus was stunning and costly. He did not fail to speak up, nor did he deny that he knew Jesus. He stood before his accusers with a simple testimony saying, it's not about me, it's all about him. So maybe ask yourself the question next time you see WWJD, what would John do in the circumstance? How would he speak? How would he act? So that everything that he does points not to himself, but to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. It's sometimes challengingly be asked, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Well, that is quite a thought provoking question to ask, isn't it? Maybe we need to look again at John the Baptist, remind ourselves what it cost him to be faithful to Jesus, but also remember that consistently and faithfully he pointed a way for himself so that people might make much of Jesus and they would esteem him highly.